Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Welcome to our interactive stargazing event and our final Mars opposition live stream. Uh, this afternoon, we have a lot of cool objects to look at and a few guest speakers to talk about research on Mars. Um, so I'm super excited to get the program started tonight. Um, right off the bat, I have the Sculptor Galaxy pulled up for us to look at. Uh, talk about that just for a little bit here. So the Sculptor Galaxy is a bright intermediate spiral galaxy of about 70,000 light years across that lies around uh, like 11 million light years away from in the southern constellation Sculptor. And it's actually a starburst galaxy. So the Sculptor Galaxy is currently having a lot of star formation. And a lot of the reasoning has to do with stellar winds that are in the galaxy and the super star clusters that are in there. And so while these stars die, uh, the gas gets expelled from these stars and then it coalesces into nebulas and starts star formation all over again. Um, so as you can see from the image of this galaxy itself, the brightest part is the central core of this galaxy. And so that's that little tiny dot right there in the center. And then kind of more off to the sides that way is the actual spiral arms of this galaxy. And so uh, we're kind of looking at it almost edge on. It's like slightly tilted towards us there. Uh, but you can really see some of that structure towards the core of this galaxy. And so you can also see that this image is very, very blue. And the reason why that is, is that we have a really nice bright uh, moon up in the sky tonight. And so up in Flagstaff AZ, it is pretty windy, pretty chilly, and pretty moony. So we have a lot of uh, factors going into the sky tonight there. So we're going to try to keep ourselves uh, looking at brighter objects. And so while we're on the topic of bright objects, let's go to maybe the moon. And see, yeah, uh, we just color balanced it there, uh, kind of took away some of that blue. But so while we move to the moon, uh, let me talk real quick about the program that we are using tonight. Uh, so we are using uh, our plane wave CDK telescope with a Malin cam hooked up to the back of it. And so the Malin cam is basically a camera uh, that can take live exposures of different objects in the sky. And so the software that we're using is the Malincam Sky software. And it, we can edit the pictures, we can change the color, change the exposure, uh, saturation. And so that's what is kind of going on here. So you can see there, uh, they're dragging the little green exposure box and then we can get a whole bunch of different cool uh, shots of the moon really, you know, bring up the light, bring down the light. Uh, and then we can also change the color around too. So it looks pretty yellow, pretty green right now, but as soon as they actually um, change that color balance, the white balance, look at that, it's perfect. Um, so that's what's super cool about this software is not only we can manipulate the image right there on the scene, we can also move really fast to a whole bunch of different objects. So the plane wave telescopes that we use uh, are basically this point and click system so it's run on uh, the plane wave interface and you just get a whole screen of what is up at the night sky and you can just point and click to the object that you want to go to and it moves there. And so that's exactly what is shown right now, that whole entire show of the sky there. And then you can just point and click and go. And so that's what we did, we went to the moon. And so again, we have a really nice bright moon out right now. I believe it's in a waning gibbous phase. Um, and we have a lot of that mare that's facing on our side here. Uh, the mare of the moon, in case you don't know what that is, it was when the moon had active volcanism at one point and it left these different mare, these uh, dark spots, these deposits on the lunar surface there. And then we have some really bright views on the moon. And so I believe we have, you know, these little white, but they look very bright craters. And so what's happening there is that when these different objects hit the moon, they actually deposited material that was underneath the surface and it kind of laid on top of the moon there. And so that's why we got these really, really bright streaks all over the moon is uh, that other material got put on top of everything else. So it looks very, very bright. 
And so we already have a whole bunch of requests coming in. So let me check real quick. Um, a request from Mike Toomey, a binary or two please. Um, and how's the seeing? Again, this, yeah, the seeing's pretty poor. We could do a binary. Um, we could do uh, Alberio. Alberio is a very good binary. We could do that one. Um, yeah, so let, let's try, let's try Alberio. So Alberio is a binary star system in the constellation Cygnus the Swan. I really like Alberio. It's like my go-to binary system that I look at just because of the color, color contrast in the two stars. And so with Alberio, we have a blue star and kind of this yellow orangey star. And so the color difference from these two stars mainly has to do with the temperature difference of these stars. So the blue one is a lot, lot hard, hotter than its uh, companion there, the yellow one. And that also factors into age. So uh, hot stars generally are a lot younger. They don't live very long. They burn through their fuel faster compared to cooler stars, those red ones, uh, red, yellowish ones, uh, where they don't burn super long and uh, or super fast so they live a lot longer and so yeah i really like those two um there all right let's see what else we have we have another request from glenn frank jupiter and saturn are near each other tonight right is it possible to see the two of them clearly in the same view or are they too small to see together so that's a great question so why don't we go over to saturn real quick and take a look it looks like they are getting pretty low. So let's try to get these before they set. And so, yeah, that was a very great question. So with the field of view that the uh, plane wave actually has, it is too, they're too far apart for them to be in the same field of view. And so we can view them each individually. Oh my goodness, oh no. So you can actually see how poor the seeing is tonight, unfortunately. Um, you can see how soupy, uh, Saturn looks there, it's just kind of wiggling around. And so uh, this has to do with our atmosphere, it has to do with the wind, the moon right now. Uh, the effect that's going on with the planet, what I like to say is like it's looking at when you're in the bottom of a pool and looking up, uh, all the water is moving, all the light around. And so it's kind of like the same effect, like you're at the bottom of a pool. So that's pretty unfortunate. Uh, but you can still see, you know, the rings of Saturn and you can see the bright planet right in the center there. And so that's what we're working with tonight. And so let's try to get Jupiter as well before it gets too low in the sky. Um, we'll be able to see the moons of Jupiter in the same field of view. Um, so that's a plus. Um, so if we bring up the exposure time, for Jupiter, uh, we will be able to see the moons. And so if you see all those dots in the line there, those are the moons of Jupiter. So we have Ganymede, we have Callisto, we have Io, and we have Europa. And so I don't necessarily know the order of the moons uh, tonight. Uh, they're constantly changing and it looks like one moon is either out of the field of view, so it's too far away, or it's transiting in front of the planet, which I actually believe to be the case. And so we can turn down the exposure again, and we can see if we can try to make out the surface of Jupiter. Um, usually we can see a lot of striations on Jupiter. We can see the different banding of the atmosphere. Uh, but tonight, Jupiter just kind of looks like a little yellow dot. <laughs> That's OK, though. All right, so let me see what other requests that we have tonight. Um, Daniel Millets asks, I would like to see Pleiades. Any chance we can see Pleiades tonight in Taurus? Um, is the Pleiades high enough yet? I don't know if they are high enough in the sky just yet. Um, yeah, let's try it. Let's see if uh, the Pleiades is up. And so again, with the field of view that the plane wave telescope gets, we will not be able to see the whole entire Pleiades in the camera. So we only will be able to get like one star, two stars that are actually in the Pleiades. Um, 
yeah, we're just super, super zoomed in there. But yeah, so these, these looks like they are some of the stars that are in Pleiades. And so a lot, a big misconception that I actually get up at Lowell a lot is that the Pleiades looks like the Little Dipper. And so people will see it and they'll be like, oh, there's the Little Dipper. And so it's really uh, funny because the Pleiades do look like a Little Dipper, but there is no asterism, no kind of formation that's recognized with the Pleiades. The Pleiades is an open star cluster. So it is a younger cluster of stars. And you can see uh, we're kind of zooming in, zooming in on that field of view of the Pleiades so you can kind of see how wide it is. Um, and so all those little stars there, yeah, just kind of make out a little dipper shape. But like I was saying, the Pleiades is a open star cluster. They're younger stars. And so these stars uh, were born from a giant cloud of gas called a nebula. And this nebula uh, started forming the, all these little baby stars. And eventually all these baby stars ate up all the gas in that nebula to make this open star cluster. And so again, they're very, very young and throughout their life, they'll continue to spread out and kind of interact with one another. Their gravity will kind of push and pull them in certain directions. And so that's how we get open star clusters. And so what's ironic about people thinking the Pleiades is the Little Dipper is that the Little Dipper constellation itself actually is another open star cluster. Um, so I think it's kind of funny that people get the two mixed up, but yes, uh, that is the Pleiades. And I, I, they're just starting to come up here uh, around the evening. We're getting into the winter constellations now, which is super exciting. Uh, all right, so let's see what else. Um, I think that is it for the requests. So if anyone has any requests for objects to look at tonight, um, please put them in the chat. You know, we're super uh, excited to look at all these different objects that you guys are requesting for tonight. Oh, so actually we just got another request, got a request from Brian. Hi, Brian. So Brian asks, hi, Hannah, have you looked at the Ring Nebula yet? No, we have not. So uh, yeah, let's try to look at the Ring Nebula. I think it's going to be um, very bright. Uh, bright like the moon might be in the way, um, but let's see, let's see how that looks here. Um, it looks like the moon's actually cut quite a distance away from the ring nebula. Um, yeah, let's, let's, let's check out the ring. So, uh, we're moving to the ring nebula. This is in the constellation Lyra, the liar. Um, so the ring nebula is an object called a planetary nebula. It's going to look very round. And once upon a time, uh, astronomers thought these objects uh, looked so round that they decided to call them planetary nebulas, even though they have nothing to do with planets at all. Um, and so these objects form when smaller sized stars die. So our sun is considered a smaller sized star. And we use the sun kind of on a basis to measure how much other stars weigh. And so our sun, we say, is one solar mass. And so a star that's less than three solar masses, when they die, they will form these planetary nebulas. And so uh, the core of these stars will eventually stop uh, fusing hydrogen and helium. They'll start fusing these heavier elements and they won't have enough resources really to keep itself sustaining. So the outer layers of the star will start to drift off uh, in different uh, layers and different levels, kind of like an onion. Uh, sometimes I also like to say it's kind of like a bath bomb. The outer layers will kind of drift off and then we're left with this ring like structure. And so there's still a lot of research going on when it comes to these planetary nebulas. We actually think they have more of like a cylindrical shape, kind of like a soda can. Uh, again, it's still very active research. We're still kind of learning about how these are formed. But so the ring nebula, we're kind of looking down on the structure of these planetary nebulas. So there's another object up in the sky tonight called the Dumbbell Nebula. If you want to go there just super, super quick, the Dumbbell Nebula is kind of looking at this edge-on view of the planetary nebula. 
And so you can kind of see, look at the ring, it's kind of circular, you're looking down in the planetary nebula. And then when we move to the dumbbell, it'll be kind of edge on like this. And so again, we have a lot of colors in the ring nebula and we have a lot of colors in the dumbbell nebula and that corresponds to the elements uh, that were in the star and the outer layers of the star. Um, yeah, so there's dumbbell. Again, it's on its side. We have some blues, we have some reds. And so that has to do with hydrogen and helium and oxygen and carbon um, and all those good things to make those really pretty colors. And so this gas is ionized, it's excited. And so that's why we can see uh, this gas in the first place, the host star, uh, the little center star there, it's called a white dwarf. So that is the leftover core, the remnant of uh, these dead stars. And so in the ring nebula and in the double nebula, right in the center there uh, is the dead core of that star. And eventually those will cool off too. But let's see some other recommendations for tonight. Uh, we have Mike Toomey asking for NGC 457. Uh, yeah, let's, let's go to NGC 457. So that is the OWL cluster, I believe. And so the OWL cluster is located in the constellation Cassiopeia. And so Cassiopeia in the sky looks like a giant W. I think it's one of the easiest constellations to find. And the owl cluster looks like an owl. Um, some people call it ET, uh, call it an owl. You have to really use your imagination to kind of look at the shape of this creature. Um, but so the two brightest stars in the top left corner, those are supposed to be the eyes of the owl. And then uh, use your imagination to kind of go on from there. Uh, but this is actually a really good view of the owl cluster right now. And so again, it's a younger cluster of stars. These uh, open clusters are very young, fairly early on in their formation. Um, and eventually, you know, with interaction or gravity, they'll kind of push and pull on one another and spread out. Okay, so we have another quest from William Bailey, M33 Galaxy in Triangulum. Uh, we can try it. It is probably going to be pretty diffuse. You know, um, it's very bad seeing tonight, uh, but we can try and see what it will look like. Uh, so we're gonna wait a few seconds here so we can take a long enough exposure to where it'll look good. So uh, M33, I believe that is just the Triangulum Galaxy. Um, super convenient naming uh, for this galaxy in Triangulum. So Triangulum is, uh, is a constellation that's basically just in the shape of a triangle, uh, nothing too fancy about it. And then the Triangulum Galaxy itself is a spiral galaxy and this one is actually face on so compared to sculptor galaxy sculptor was mainly like an edge on kind of galaxy where this one's completely face on where we can see the structure of the rings and the uh, structure of the arms in the galaxy and we can really see how bright the core is and so even though it is a pretty moony picture pretty blue uh you can still see in the center of this the core of the galaxy. That's where a lot of the older stars are, where the supermassive black hole is. And then kind of around there, that is where the spiral arms are. That's where we have a lot of that star formation. That's where the exoplanets will be. Um, all that good stuff, all that formation stuff is happening in the arms of this galaxy. So pretty cool. Um, so Night Wolf requested NGC 253. So that's the Sculptor Galaxy. That was actually the first galaxy that we looked at tonight. Um, so feel free to kind of go back in the live stream and check that one out. It looked really awesome. Uh, we have another request. Uh, Mike Toomey asked for the ET cluster. I believe we just looked at that one. Um, the Owl cluster. Uh, Daniel Milletz asks, I would like to see the star Aldebaran, uh, Aldebaran, <laughs> and Aldebaran is too low, unfortunately, uh, <laughs> we can't see that one tonight, uh, 
We have someone else asking, Starman Tom asked to see the Stefan's Quintet. Uh, yeah, let's do Stefan's Quintet. That's a good one. <laughs> awesome. So Stefan's Quintet is a little cluster of galaxies. So compared to what we've been looking at with the open clusters, that's a cluster of stars. This one is actually a cluster of galaxies. And so they're going to be pretty diffuse, kind of faint, uh, but they uh, there's just a group of clusters and it looks a group of clusters, a cluster of galaxies. And yeah, it just, it's super cool. I really don't know too much about uh, this little group of galaxies, but uh, it is very awesome to look at, in my opinion. Being able to see all these galaxies all far away in just a little group. And so our galaxy, the Milky Way, is actually also a part of a group of galaxies. So galaxies kind of like to cluster together, just like stars do. And so the Andromeda is part of this cluster. The Milky Way, I believe, uh, Triangulum is also part of this cluster. So uh, we call them the, our local group of galaxies. So awesome. So yeah, so you can see right in the center there uh, where the cursor is. Uh, that is where these little galaxies are. Cool. So let's see, we have another request for M31. So that is Andromeda. So let's check out Andromeda. Is it too close to the moon? Uh, yeah, uh, we'll definitely try Andromeda, but again, it's going to be very close to the moon. So it's gonna be probably all washed out. Uh, the main part of Andromeda that we can look at is the core of the galaxy. Uh, Andromeda is very, very bright in the sky. You can actually see Andromeda with your naked eye when you look up into the sky. So if you know where to look, you can see this very, very, very diffuse uh, kind of little blob in the sky, and that's the Andromeda galaxy. And so if we could actually see it super bright, if it wasn't just a little blob, uh, it would probably be as big as the full moon. But again, we can only see the brightest part of the galaxy with our own eyes, which is the core. And so just to remind everyone, uh, in 10 minutes, we have the Mars section coming up. So we'll look at Mars probably last, and then we'll get into the research part of the live stream tonight. So just bear with us just for a few more minutes. And so here is the Andromeda galaxy again, like how I was saying, the core is going to be the brightest part. But I really like this view that's really blown out where the core is super bright because you can really see the dust lanes in the spiral arms there. So that kind of dark streaking beneath that bright core is the dust in the spiral arms. And so again, that's where that star formation is going on. That's where the other exoplanets are. All the young stuff in this galaxy are in the arms compared to the core. Um, very cool. The Andromeda galaxy looks surprisingly really awesome tonight. Uh, this is probably one of the best views I've seen of Andromeda in quite a long time. I usually don't blow out the core like this, so it's very, very cool. I uh, really like this image. All right, so we have another request for M13. So M13 is pretty low in the night sky, so uh, M13 is a globular star cluster, so to kind of supplement that we can do M15 um, because M13 is probably way too low to see. So yeah, let's try let's try M, uh, M15. So M15 is the great Pegasus cluster, I believe. Uh, it's in the constellation Pegasus. Um, and it's another globular cluster like M13. And so M13 is a globular cluster in Hercules, M15 is the globular cluster in Pegasus. And compared to the open clusters that we saw, again, young features, these globular clusters are very, very old. Uh, the stars are actually around the same age as our own galaxy. And so there's a lot of formation theories that go into, you know, how these globular clusters came to be. We actually, there's a leading theory. Oh, it looks like M15 is right at the moon. Mm, so we're gonna move it to another globular cluster, I believe M2. 
again, they all pretty much have the same look, just a bunch of stars very, very close together. Uh, yeah, we'll see how this one looks uh, instead. But uh, what was I saying? They're very, very old features, very old stars. And so uh, the lead formation theory right now is that they were their own clusters or they were their own galaxies uh, that were forming. And during the Milky Way's formation, we actually passed by these little forming galaxies and kind of sucked them up into our own. And so the globular clusters don't orbit exactly in the plane of the Milky Way. So they kind of orbit all around uh, the Milky Way in something that we call the halo of our galaxy. So they're kind of floating around there. They're not uh, right in the spiral arms of our galaxy. And so a lot of these globular clusters as well in the core uh, have a supermassive black hole in them. So that also is more reason for us to think that they are, or they were in their own galaxies that the Milky Way just kind of decided to bring along with them. So I think that's super cool. Very old stars. All right. Um, we have a request for the Eagle Nebula, but the Eagle Nebula, unfortunately, is too low. It's uh, pretty set right now. You should be able to see it just as soon as it starts to get dark out. Uh, but it's been dark maybe for around two hours now in Flagstaff. So as soon as it gets dark outside, you might uh, be able to get a chance to see that. Um, we have a request from Heather Craig to see the Snowball Nebula. Um, so let's check that out real quick. So I think we'll do uh, two more objects uh, and then wrap it up for the night. So um, we also had a request for the Lagoon Nebula and that one as well it was too low in the sky tonight. Uh, again, if you go out as soon as it starts to get dark out, uh, you should be able to catch Lagoon and catch Eagle before they set. And so here is the Snowball Nebula. I love this one. Um, so if we can zoom in on the field of view there, it's this little, little tiny planetary nebula um, with the exposures that we have. Usually it looks like a, just a little blue circle, but we can turn down the exposure and we can really start to get some structure and these really tiny nebula. So in reality, they aren't so tiny. They're not tiny, you know, they're really, really big. They're just really far away. And so this one's really cool. You can see kind of this ring feature uh, with the blue snowball and you can barely, barely just make out the white dwarf right in the center there. Um, so even though it's super far away and it's super tiny, you can still see that white dwarf, which I think is awesome. So this one is one of my favorites. It's really cute, really cute and little. All right, so let's, we have another request for the double cluster in Perseus from William Bailey. So yeah, let's try that one. Um, again, this one might be close to the moon, so I guess we'll see how it looks. And so the double cluster in Perseus is two open clusters right next to one another. Um, so when we do point the telescope to it, uh, we're probably only going to get one cluster in the field of view. I guess we'll kind of see where it decides to go. Sometimes the telescope likes to move around in this little area. Um, but we can kind of jog the telescope around too to kind of see um, how they both individually look. Again, this field of view is very zoomed in for the plane wave. So. Yep, so there's one of them, one of the open clusters in Perseus. And so that section of the sky uh, in Perseus, Cassiopeia, Andromeda, it, there's just so many open clusters uh, in that area. You can get a portable telescope, you can even get some really powerful binoculars and just kind of scan the sky in that region and you'll just see a whole bunch of stars. It's a very, very beautiful part of the sky, uh, very active. So that's awesome, love that view. All right, so last but not least, let's end on Mars. So let's go take a look at how Mars is looking tonight. It is very close to the moon as well, uh, starting to pull away from opposition, heading back towards its, the regular part of its orbit. And so that this view of Mars is actually pretty funny because you can see the 
a reflection of one of the mirrors in our plane wave. So let's zoom in here and we should be able to see some structure again. And this thing's very, very bad. Oh no, unfortunately, uh, uh, it looks like the seeing is just so bad tonight uh, that Mars just looks like a little orange dot. Uh, but fret not, we actually have a view of Mars through the Clark telescope as well. Um, so what our plane wave can't see, maybe the Clark will be able uh, to make out some structure on the surface. And so um, I really can't make out any features. Um, it doesn't look like I can see any like basalt uh, fields or anything like that, polar caps, just, just a little orange dot, but that's all right. And so this is a great transition real quick into the uh, research portion of the live stream tonight. And so not only, I forgot to introduce myself, but I'm Hannah, I'm an educator at Lowell, uh, but not only do I educate the public on space at Lowell, I also do research at NAU on Mars. And so a lot of my research that I do on Mars uh, consists of looking at the mineral olivine on Mars and looking at the distribution of this mineral all over the surface. And so uh, looking at this distribution can help us understand the origin and kind of where volcanic activity happened on the surface. So uh, olivine is the first mineral to crystallize in volcanic activity. And so when you see olivine, you know there was volcanic activity there. And so I'm kind of just looking at where these exposures are, where the distribution is along the Martian surface. Uh, so we can figure out, you know, where all this volcanic activity happened. And then what stemmed from that project is uh, looking at ancient valley networks. And so there are, there's been evidence to show that there has been previous activity, water activity on the surface of Mars. And so unfortunately, Mars isn't too wet anymore. We're still kind of working on that, trying to see uh, how much water is still present on the Martian surface, if any. But at one point, Mars had water flowing all over the surface and it created these valley networks that look very similar to the rivers and channels that we see here on Earth. And so some of the valley networks that I study on Mars actually have olivine deposited into them. And so this olivine kind of preserved some of these valley networks. And so uh, what we're thinking is these preserved valley networks are some of the oldest, if not the oldest valley networks uh, that we've ever observed on the Martian surface. So it's super exciting. Uh, it's still stuff that I'm currently working on. So I'll get back to you guys, publish a paper <laughs> on the findings of that. Um, so it's super exciting. And so this actually kind of ties into the work that Jennifer Hanley does here. And so I'll pass it over uh, to you guys now uh, to talk about more research that's going on right now on Mars. And if we know of there's any bugs or water <laughs> currently going on now with Mars. So thank you so much uh, for having me tonight. And I was super, had a super good time showing you guys all the different things that we have tonight, even with uh, some of the poor conditions. So thank you everyone. Okay, I think we're on, uh, we're waiting for one or two other guests. Thanks, uh, Hannah, for your presentation. That was really interesting. And unfortunately, the scene was a bit bad, but nothing that can be done about that particularly. Uh, somebody once said that in good seeing, it's a little bit like you're doing a waltz with one of the celestial objects. And tonight, unfortunately, the objects were uh, insistent on doing the jitterbug. So I guess that's what it is. Well, this is the fourth and last of our special events, um, YouTube live streaming events related to this opposition of Mars. And just as a brief reminder of why uh, we're doing this, uh, in 1894, Percival Lowell established the Lowell Observatory uh, to pursue his dream that Mars might be an inhabited world. And at that time, Mars was at an opposition that was very similar to the one this year. 
In fact, the opposition date this year was October 13th, and the one in 1894 was October 20th. So in a sense, it was like going uh, on a time machine this year back to the time that Percival Lowell established the observatory. And uh, so we've been in our various um, installments of this beginning in October, uh, have been talking a lot about the history of Mars studies uh, by Lowell and others, and uh, when Mars was still a very mysterious uh, celestial object. Um, and the best that we could do was uh, look at it uh, through telescopes like the Clark Refractor uh, with one's own eyeball and make sketches uh, on, a, on a notebook and try to uh, put together some sort of a picture of what was going on. And uh, many, and so, some of us anyway, grew up in that era before spacecraft arrived at Mars and began to give us a more reliable idea of what, uh, what's really there. And now it's gotten to the point where, in fact, our knowledge of Mars is, is um, approaching, if not yet, at the level of what we know about the moon or the Earth. Um, and, and so um, astronomers have more or less ceded it, C-E-D-E-D, -E -D, uh, to geologists, meteorologists, chemists, and other people that look at things in that level of detail. And so tonight we're going to take you away from the primitive era of looking through telescopes uh, to the era of uh, actually virtually standing on the planet with our rovers and uh, flying around the planet with our orbiters. Uh, and I would like, like to uh, just briefly mention and dedicate this um, program uh, to a very important and distinguished Mars explorer who lived right here in Flagstaff and was a professor at NAU, someone, someone that I never actually had the chance to meet, but um, you know a lot of people that did work with her and uh, know, know a great deal about some of her research. And I, I would just recommend this book, which I spent the last couple of days uh, perusing, which is just uh, essentially a compendium of all that we know about Mars. And I, I think um, it's just amazing to see what we now know uh, about the way that Mars formed, uh, the internal structure of, of Mars, um, whether the core is liquid, what it's constituted of, the mantle, which includes things like olivine, uh, the, the crust and the various aspects of the crust that include uh, some of the older uh, terrains on Mars, where, which are heavily impacted, and then the uh, more recent um, volcanic uh, features, uh, including some huge shield uh, volcanoes, lava flows, and in a lot of ways, Flagstaff really is a perfect place to study Mars because it, there are so many features around Flagstaff uh, that remind us of similar features on Mars. Uh, so I just wanted to uh, mention uh, Nadine and um, uh, just, just um, with appreciation for all that she did, all the students that she inspired, all the research that she did, and unfortunately she was tragically lost to us this past summer uh, at, at far too early an age. So, um, and uh, that's a good segue, I think, for us to uh, bring aboard an even younger person, Jennifer Hanley, who's associated with both uh, NAU and Lowell and is, is a phenomenal researcher. She's doing some really exciting research uh, for uh, NASA and um, I, I think rather than my saying more about her work, I think I, I will turn it over to Jennifer herself to present to us her views about Mars from, from uh, standing right there on the surface. Thanks, Bill. Uh, yeah, so I figured I'd talk a little bit about some of the research I'm working on uh, that entails looking for water on Mars that Hannah kind of mentioned. We're still looking for it. Um, so if we, uh, really when we're thinking about water, uh, salts are really the interesting thing to look for. We know that there's not water now, but um, there might've been in the past. But before I go too far into 
my research, I do just want to uh, take a minute and, you know, mention, um, as Bill said, Dr. Nadine Barlow. Um, so I worked with Nadine. She was the chair of the Department of Astronomy and Planetary Science uh, at NAU. I guess she wasn't when I started, but she became chair then. And she's really been very help. She was always very helpful to me, uh, you know, just helping me get set up there. Uh, our lab is down at NAU, and I work with a lot of students down there. And so she's all, she was always very friendly and did anything she could to help out. And um, she also led some really great field trips around the Flagstaff area, in particular Meteor Crater. Um, so that was, um, yeah, that was always really fun, and she will definitely be missed. So, um, you know, talking a little bit about my research on Mars, uh, we know that there has been ample evidence of past water on Mars, and we see evidence of these streamlined islands. So you can see here water in both images flows from the top to the bottom, and it kind of forms around this um, crater here. You can see the, the, de the deposition of the sediment uh, downstream, and then these valley networks. Uh, and they look a lot like rivers on Earth. And we also have evidence of deltas. So this is similar to, um, for instance, New Orleans and how you have this big river, it's carrying a lot of sediment, it's moving very fast. It hits a standing body of water. Uh, so in this case, this is Ebersold Crater. And so we have a river flowing in, it hits this standing body of water and it uh, drops all of its uh, sediment, creating a delta. And the thing is that the conditions on Mars aren't actually quite right to have liquid water on Mars today. So the high on Mars is maybe only 20 degrees Celsius, and that is in the middle of the day, at the peak of summer at the equator. So it really doesn't get very warm there. Uh, it barely gets above freezing in just very specific conditions. Most of the time, uh, the average is about 220 Kelvin or about minus 50 Celsius. Uh, and then it can get really cold at the poles in winter. So here on the right, we have this phase diagram. Uh, this is the phase diagram for water. Uh, you can see here uh, temperature along the x-axis and pressure along the y-axis. Of course, we have one atmospheric pressure, that's Earth. 273, that is the known freezing point of pure water. And so you can see here that's one atmosphere in 273. But of course, we get much warmer here on Earth uh, through this pressure range. However, Mars's atmospheric pressure is only um, 0 0.006 bar or 0 0.006 atmosphere. And you can see here that we never even really get into the liquid stability range. Even if it were to get a little bit warm, the pressure isn't high enough for us to have liquids. So <laughs> how do we have liquid then? And, and what was it like in the past? So one way that we can actually start to get liquids is with salts. And so salts affect the stability of water in different ways. Uh, it can lower the freezing temperature. So uh, this is why we salt roads in the winter. Uh, it actually uh, has the ice melt at a different a lower temperature. It also increases the boiling point and it also slows down the evaporation rate. So here's that said in another way or visually represented. So if we have ice here, uh, pure water on Earth's surface uh, freezes at zero Celsius. Uh, it boils at 100 degrees Celsius. That's at the um, sea level. If you're in Flagstaff, <laughs> uh, you know, if you're at elevation, you have less atmosphere above you. And so uh, actually the boiling point of water in Flagstaff is about 93 degrees Celsius. And that's why we have all these high altitude baking books, um, you know, people sell them for, for Denver and everything like that, because uh, the temperature that water boils at, the maximum temperature you can have liquid water to cook in is, is lower than at sea level. And so you're cooking slower. Um, but salts 
or sorry, Mars uh, is, as I mentioned, has a much lower atmospheric pressure. So even though water still freezes at zero Celsius, uh, it, it boils at 10 degrees Celsius because it has that much less atmosphere than, than Earth does. However, if we add salt to the mix, we can extend the stability range in both directions. So we actually get, um, if we add this one specific salt called magnesium perchlorate, we can get liquid down to minus, almost minus 70 degrees Celsius. And it actually increases the boiling temperature. So we actually see it boiling at 24 degrees Celsius. So um, this, is, this is one way that we can maybe get liquid water on Mars today. It's not pure liquid water, it's salty. And it really is important what kind of salt it is. So different salts uh, affect water in different ways. So chlorine salts generally have a lower freezing temperature than, for instance, sulfate salts. So sulfate salts would be like Epsom. Epsom salt is a magnesium sulfate. Um, of course, we have sodium chloride. That's halite. That's common table salt. That's NaCl. Uh, that freezes, uh, lowers the freezing point of water to about 250. Um, magnesium chloride is very common. Um, magnesium perchlorate I mentioned. Uh, and calcium perchlorate actually has the lowest known uh, freezing point of any single salt. So salts are really, really fun because they can extend the stability range in, in both directions. Um, they can also be a source of energy. So some of these have oxygen on them and some microbes can utilize that oxygen uh, for, for energy. So salts are also important because they are extremely hygroscopic, and that means that they are water-loving. Uh, and the hydration state is closely tied to both the temperature and the relative humidity. So this is a video uh, that I recorded, and it is of a process called deliquescence. And so deliquescence is the process of the salt uh, absorbing water vapor from the atmosphere. So you see the salt here is this white stuff. Uh, this is a spectrometer, a fiber optic probe for a spectrometer. Uh, so you can see here that it starts to condense, basically the water uh, actually dissolves into the salt. It starts out on the edges and it slowly spreads. And so you can actually see uh, the salt becomes transparent as it dissolves into the water. So we're getting um, actual liquid water, all we have, all we start with is salt, a dry crystalline salt and water vapor from the atmosphere. And because these salts love water so much, we can actually get liquid droplets. So this is one very favorite theory as to how we can get maybe some liquid droplets on the surface of Mars today. So, um, another, um, thing to remember is that it's really important to differentiate between these salts. As I mentioned, different salts have different freezing points. Um, and so it's really important to differentiate because if it's warmer, maybe that means that it's not liquid during certain seasons, but maybe life actually likes it better. So there's this concept of extremophiles or halophiles. Halophiles would be salt-loving extremophiles. There's extreme loving microorganisms. And there are uh, known microorganisms that can survive in these very salty conditions, but not too salty, and that's the catch. So uh, one interesting example is this haloarchaea and cyanobacteria that can actually occur within halite crusts. So this image in the back is, um, you know, the halite salt, uh, NaCl. And, um, but I, I think it's so interesting. So there was a study done in the Atacama Desert, which is one of the driest places on Earth in Chile. And they actually measured how many times it rained in a year. And it rained one time in that year. So there was one event where you had liquid water on the surface. However, the relative humidity reached above 75%, which is the deliquescence relative humidity for halite, sodium chloride, that is the relative humidity at which this salt will turn into liquid droplets. And that actually occurred 57 different times in the course of that same year. 
So we had one rainfall event compared to 57 deliquescence events. And so these organisms figured out that if they live inside the halide crust, they get extra um, liquid events, but they have to be able to, um, you know, get that water out of the salt or get the salt out of the water and utilize that water in its pure form. Cause we don't know of any actual organisms that use the salty water itself. Anything that is tolerant of salt water um, is able to filter the salt away from it. Uh, we also know of microbial communities that can thrive in magnesium chloride rich brines. Uh, and in fact, uh, bacteria that can uh, live down to uh, cold temperatures, minus 25 Celsius, and, and high um, salt contents. And I mentioned that there is um, there are some organisms that can actually utilize that oxygen. So the chlorate and chlorate reducing bacteria, they utilize that oxygen bound on the chlorine to um, for, for energy. So uh, we have this kind of catch-22 where we want to see the liquid water stability range extended in both directions. So we want to get it like really salty. We want to find a lot of chlorine salts. Um, but the other catch to that is it can't be too salty for life. Uh, and in fact, a lot of work that's been done with uh, life and activities of water or, you know, how salty it can get has been the food industry because they actually don't want stuff to live in their, in their food um, when they preserve it. So a lot of the astrobiology biology community is working on, you know, extending that further and, and applying it to different um, planetary environments. Um, so I'm very interested to see where that goes and how extreme we can really get. In the meantime, some of the work that I'm doing is to actually try and identify the different salts on Mars. And so here we have a um, an image of... Mars, and it is of Columbus Crater, which is in the Southern Hemisphere. This crater is really interesting because it has what is called a bathtub ring, or, you know, it's similar to a bathtub ring where it was a paleo lake in the past. It was salty, and as the lake evaporated, it left behind a salt ring or a bathtub ring um, along the rim. And so uh, using the CRISM, which is a near-infrared spectrometer, so we look at spectra from one to 2.5 microns, we look at different features and we're trying to be really rigorous about this. So we're uh, combining different parameters. So in this case, you can see we have um, lots of different little lines across of the spectrum. So this top one is a spectrum from Mars and these bottom colored ones are spectra that I took in the lab. So we need to collect lab spectra to compare to Mars. And you can see here that we have some features that are similar to a few different salts here. And the main uh, commonality between these lab spectra is the hydration state. So all of these salts actually have two H2O. So even though we have the calcium chloride, a magnesium chlorate, and uh, calcium sulfate, they all have two waters. And so this is one of the things that's also really challenging in this wavelength region is we're looking at water features. Um, so the vibrational um, bands of, of water. And so we're trying to figure out differences between these salts so we can really try and identify the difference between a sulfate versus a chlorate versus a chloride. So what we're doing is using this image on the left, you can see here we have, okay, so we want the 2.4 shoulder, which is um, right here on the very right edge of it, this shoulder, this um, kind of downward, and then a, a flattening is what we call shoulder right around 2.4. So anything that has a 2.4 shoulder is lit up in yellow. Well, we can go further and combine that with, okay, well, which one has a 2.4 shoulder plus the 1.75 band? And you can see here that we highlight that in red. And then we can pull out the spectra and start to compare it to, to the lab data. So uh, this is the work that I'm, I'm doing now. <laughs> Spoiler alert, it's really difficult to distinguish between the different salts if they do have the same hydration state, particularly at the resolutions um, that the CRISM spectrometer has. 
Um, but I'm really looking forward to Perseverance. When it lands, it will also have an interface spectrometer, in addition to many other instruments that will help us disentangle um, what cells are actually present in Jezero. And we can also compare this to CRISM. And so we can kind of have that ground truth. And that's going to really open up a lot of more possibilities for research in the future. So uh, just to kind of summarize, this is this is Columbus Crater. And here are some of the different minerals that we've found, um, including our CL salt here is in the, the blue plus. And so we have found it along the rim in some of them but not in all of them. So we're still trying to, this is a you know, work in progress. Uh, we're trying to understand both the chemistry uh, and the geology behind you know, where the different salts might have formed, how that ties into the chemistry of the lake when it existed, and then how that then folds into the habitability. So um, as was said earlier, I'm definitely in the path of the geologist chemist, <laughs> um, you know, looking at these things in, in real detail, which is just a really exciting thing to be doing. So um, yeah, so to summarize, chlorine salts are really important for habitability. Uh, we do see them globally distributed across Mars. Uh, perseverance will help identify different types of salts in Jezero Crater. That's gonna be our ground truth so we can compare it to CRISM. And uh, yeah, it's really important to differentiate that. And so I hope that we can have more results soon. Uh, it does look promising. I think with the combination of different features, we might be able to, to disentangle this story. So with that, I will take any questions. Thank you. Uh, so we do actually have a couple questions already. Great. Um, so Kenny Hoskins asks, why does the atmospheric pressure affect boiling condensation temperature but not freezing melting? This is a really good question. Uh, it, it barely affects the freezing slash melting temperature. Um, it's more important at like when you go to very, very extreme pressures, uh, for instance, like deep earth, you know, deep subsurface. Um, for the most part at the temperatures and pressures, sorry, the pressures we're talking about for surface processes, it can be ignored. Um, the reason it affects uh, from gas to liquid, uh, if you think about the pressure, you know, and the change in volume that's occurring between a gas and a liquid versus a liquid and a solid. Uh, in general, liquid to a solid, there's not that much change in density. And so it's kind of more of a reordering or a crystal, you know, an ordering of, um, of the molecules from that liquid to solid phase, whereas uh, from gas to liquid, or vice versa, there's a large change in volume. And so atmospheric pressure um, is affects it more at the, at the pressures that we're used to talking about. Um, so Nightwolf asks, how does this compare to the recent release of imaging molecular H2O on the moon? Um, so I've not, I haven't read that paper in detail. Uh, I do know that they did find water on the moon, and um, I believe they did it through uh, spectroscopy. <laughs> Unfortunately, I really don't know uh, um, too much about that uh, specific press release. Um, but uh, yeah, it's the same idea where we're using the vibrational uh, frequencies of different uh, water bands to, to look for and identify these features on, on different planets. Um, yeah, I think it's really cool that there is molecular H2O on the moon and we're kind of really looking for that on Mars as well. We do know that there's a lot of water ice there. The trick is finding the liquid water. Uh, okay, another question from William Bailey. What is the relative humidity near the pole regions of Mars during the summer? So relative humidity is a very interesting concept. Uh, relative humidity is basically the percentage of water vapor in the atmosphere uh, divided by how much water vapor the atmosphere could hold at that specific temperature. So, um, you know, 100% relative humidity means that there is as much water vapor as it can hold. When you get to 100%, that's when you have precipitation or rain or snow or whatever. Um, 
So relative humidity is a function of the saturation vapor pressure, so how much water the atmosphere can hold, which is dependent on temperature. And so you actually get these um, diurnal swings uh, for relative humidity uh, based on the temperature. And the interesting thing is the actual amount of water vapor isn't really changing too much throughout that diurnal cycle. But since the temperature is changing, you actually have a relative humidity change. Now, relative humidity is still an important concept because I mentioned uh, that is what dictates deliquescence. And so some of the work that I've done in the past actually modeled the temperature and relative humidity throughout the course of um, a day at the Phoenix landing site. So that's in the North Polar regions of Mars. And it does vary, you know, it varies um, from, you know, 5% to 90%. And when you get up to high enough percentages, of relative humidity, you can actually have deliquescence of these different perchlorate salts. Um, an interesting thing is because it's actually so cold, it also will freeze and, uh, under certain conditions. So there's about three hour window at dawn, one hour at dawn and two hours at dusk or vice versa, something like that, where you have um, the right temperature and relative humidity to have stable liquid water on the surface uh, at the Phoenix landing site, even during the summer. Let's see, Starman Tom asks, do the visible water seeps seen on cliff faces on Mars tell us anything about the salt composition? Right, so I think you might be referring to recurring, recurring slope linear, which is something that I have studied. Um, and they are basically water seeps. It, it doesn't look like there's a lot of water flowing. Uh, they do darken the soil. Um, it is actually, there is an open debate among the scientific community whether these are wet or dry flows. And uh, a study that I was involved with used some of the lab spectra that I collected to identify these salts in the recurring slope linear. Uh, it's since been shown that, well, it's since been posited <laughs> that that might have been an artifact because we were using a single pixel. Now, a single pixel is really great. It's only something like 18 meters. We have really great resolution from orbit of Mars. Um, however, that's still 18 meters that you're trying to average a whole bunch of other stuff. Uh, and then the noise that comes with using a single pixel. Typically, when we do um, the spectrometer analysis, we try and average a few pixels together to um, get rid of the noise and, and increase our signal. And so it's possible that, well, there is a known artifact at the same wavelength as one of these salt features, and it is possible that um, that's what we were seeing. So it's inconclusive. <laughs> um, no salts have been definitively detected in the recurring slope linear. Um, people are still trying to figure out what causes it. Um, and, you know, I'm, I go back and forth. Uh, some of the research I do suggests one thing and then it suggests the other. That's science. That's really exciting to me too. I'm happy to be proven wrong um, as long as we get the right answer in the end. So um, I think we're done with questions. If we want, I can stop sharing. <laughs> Um, if Bill or Klaus are around, we can. Um, I've been disabled. Well, I can hear you. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. So, how, how uh, did you identify Columbus Crater as being a promising location for uh, studying the the various salts that you were interested in? Yeah. So, Columbus Crater was studied in the past by some other another team and they figured out that it was probably a paleo lake and it had this bathtub ring of salts around the rim and they identified it as quote polyhydrated sulfates which means you know um, a lot of water a lot of salts a lot of you know very hydrated salts um, and at the time, that was the only lab spectra that they had. And so for my dissertation, I actually collected this lab spectra of all the different chlorine salts. And so I felt that that was a really promising uh, location to, to start with. 
uh, for, for other reasons. Jennifer. Yep, um, Klaus, go ahead. Yeah, Jennifer, I have a question. Great, great stuff. I, I, I remember when you gave a talk to the Coconino Astronomical Society, you were just starting this and now, now you're uh, really making progress, wonderful. Uh, the one question I have as a biologist is, you know, we, we are comparing the salt tolerability to known uh, earth organisms. And that only makes sense because that's the only thing we have. Right. However, if Mars was indeed a uh, uh, water rich, say, th three billion years ago, and there was flowing water and there was a denser atmosphere and life, in fact, uh, evolved there, Chances are that uh, as things got saltier and drier and colder, that the Martian extremophiles would have adapted to those changes and possibly survived to this day at lower depth or beneath the surface. Uh, and uh, I was just wondering if, if uh, you know, what your thoughts were on that. Well, that's entirely plausible. Um, and... Uh, well, I'm getting a little bit of an echo. I'm not sure that's me, but um, so it's uh, yeah. I mean, and you can see that you can see that in the Atacama Desert that it, that um, example I talked about um, yes. in the late crust, right? So so these organisms evolved to utilize this very rare deliquescent event. I right. don't think it's out of the realm at all to think that if life had existed on Mars in the past. And the drying out was gradual enough <laughs> that life right. could have evolved to tolerate it as well, certainly. Right. Mm -hmm. And especially, you know, microbial life, because as we know, the mutation and adaptation rates of, of uh, uh, bacteria type organisms can be at lightning speed compared to everything else. Uh, we just right. have to look at the development of, you know, antibiotic resistance that we're seeing uh, and so forth. That's taking place in our lifetimes. So if the, if the freezing up and drying up of Mars was a gradual process, uh, then, uh, you know, I, I still feel there's a really good possibility that uh, there may still be subsurface life on Mars. I hope so. I want to hope so. <laughs> I mean, the, 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 on Venus, there seems to be some that, that, that maybe uh, phosphine exists, which suggests a biological signature, and that life actually managed to somehow evolve to adapt to being in the atmosphere, the cl up, upper clouds of Venus, uh, and escape the hellish surface. Uh, Jennifer, I just wanted to mention, I, I, I was just looking at some images of Scaparelli Crater, and there's a really nice bathtub ring uh, crater there, which you might want to look at. It, it's um, kind of uh, perhaps a perfect thing to advance your research further. Thanks. I'll definitely look into that. All right. I think we have another question, by the way. Yes, let's see. Tom Vassos asks, in analyzing the atmospheres of different distant exoplanets, will we be looking for some type of salt in the atmosphere as a type of biosignature? Uh, that's an interesting question. So um, biosignature, ah, oh boy, and, and, um, and Bill just touched on it with the phosphine example. There is no one biosignature that could tell us that there is life. Everything that we could find that is a pretty good indicator of life also has an abiotic um, pathway for it, including phosphine. We don't know of what the possible abiotic pathway for phosphine on Venus could be, but we do know about it in other locations. And so um, I'm not sure that salt would be we, – we don't expect to see salt in the atmospheres of, of these exoplanets. So – um, we probably wouldn't use it as a biosignature for exoplanets. However, uh, one really fun thing is looking at it in plumes. <laughs> so, um, for a solid body, for instance, like Enceladus or Europa, where we have these geysers or plumes of water shooting out of the surface, um, we're actually sampling the, the water or, you know, it turns into, to water vapor and we can, collect the amount of, if we like fly through it and analyze it, we can see how much salt is there. And that can tell us something about the habitability of the ocean uh, beneath the surface of those planets. 
or, you know, planetary bodies. Um, but yeah, I think probably for atmospheres, we would expect it mostly to be in the surface, you know, so in the, in the liquid or the solid component. Speaking of those moons, uh, like the Enceladus and Europa, uh, was any significant surface spectroscopy done that would tell you whether there are some salt residues uh, in and around some of these plumes? Um, so Maybe Cassini you, didn't have a sensitive instrument? They did, yeah. So, so it's definitely uh, VIMS, the visible and infrared mapping spectrometer. Um, Enceladus on the surface pretty much looks like pure water ice. And so yeah. the plumes, uh, the water vapor that they sampled is from a subsurface ocean. Right. Uh, they did de detect salts in that uh, subsurface ocean um, or in the plume from, from that ocean. Right. Uh, Europa absolutely has salts on the surface. Um, half, almost half of the uh, surface is kind of this reddish material that we think is some type of probably irradiated salts. It's possible it's um, irradiated sulfuric acid um, implanted from Io, but it also could be sulfate salts or chlorine salts or irradiated salts or a combination of all of those things. But there's definitely something um, going on on Europa. It's possible that we are seeing um, down from the subsurface ocean. Um, when Europa Clipper goes, uh, we'll get a lot better um, right, right. imaging and spectroscopy from that. Right. When is that supposed to go? Or has it been approved yet? Uh, they're building it right now. So I believe oh, launch right. is 2024. It's coming up, I think. Mm. It's soon. It's, it's in the, yeah. you know, decade. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. Jennifer, when, um, there, there has been a lot of interest for a long time in this great northern sea on Mars, this flat area that appears um, uh, to have many characteristics of, uh, you know, sort of a deep floor ocean uh, surface, although it's certainly been controversial and a lot of the shoreline kind of the features that you'd expect from an ocean don't uh, seem to appear there. Uh, is the presence or absence of salt in that area of any use in helping to better define the history of that part of the planet and whether this ocean would have existed? Because you would certainly expect if you had a standing body of water for an extended period of time early in the history of Mars, that um, some of these uh, salts would have leached out of the uh, minerals into the into that ocean. Yeah, that's a that's a really interesting way to get at that question. Um, we don't really see extensive deposits of, of these salts in the the northern lowlands. Um, we don't see a lot of extensive deposits of anything. Mars is really dusty, and uh, the near infrared spectrometer is only sensitive to the top few centimeters of, of material. And so if there's a lot of dust, we're not really seeing what's there. Um, where are all the carbonates? You know, so, um, if, if it's, uh, Mars had a, a carbon dioxide, a thicker carbon dioxide atmosphere in the past and it had a lot of water, we should have carbonates forming. And we don't see those in, in large deposits either. Um, we're missing, we're definitely missing some of the story. And I think that we're limited by the current instruments um, that we have. Yeah, but, uh, how, how will uh, Perseverance um kind of helped to clarify the picture because it is, is supposed to actually do some, um, you know, subsurface kinds of exploration that would really be interesting to add to this. Because as you said, I mean, on Mars, dust is ubiquitous. I mean, you know, you, you would be very successful if you opened up a vacuum uh, cleaning shop in Mars. <laughs> Yeah, so Perseverance is going to land in Jezero Crater, which uh, also was a paleo lake. Um, and uh, it has a really nice uh, delta feature. And it, I think that we'll, the both good and the bad about doing landing uh, in rovers is that we might get a lot of detail, but in one specific location. And so I think we're going to, Find a lot, find out a lot of information about how Jezero formed, what its you know history was through the ages, um, both from when it formed to when it was a lake to when it dried out, 
but it's just going to tell us about what happened there. I mean, you wouldn't come to Flagstaff and say that you know what's happening in Hawaii on Earth, right? And so Mars was probably very different in different locations, just like Earth is. And so I think it'll be really exciting to find out what happened there, and it'll give us a piece of the puzzle. But we're still we still have a long way to go. And wasn't wasn't uh, there a, a Paleo Lake uh, in like Gustav Crater? Yeah, it? It, it the evidence points towards that. But that doesn't really uh, shed any light on your your uh, question about the salts. Unfortunately, again, it's just uh, it doesn't seem to have been too salty. Um, so uh again we're not finding like large deposits of of salts um but then you kind of have to wonder where the salts would go because a lot of these salts would stay in the liquid until the very end because they are so so water loving and so where was the last bit of water and that's where we need to go look <laughs> for the salts right and yeah. a lot of that could be ice under the surface really which is where right. most of the water on on mars is um and that, that that appears to be an enormous amount of, of water that's yeah we keep finding more too <laughs> yeah. even at latitudes that we don't expect it to be <laughs> wow well, exciting we're, prospects really yeah. are we're close to the end of our program i think aren't we unless there's some someone dying to ask a last minute question well there is one on the rings of saturn yes um the rings of saturn that are chunks of ice are they pure water ice or salt water ice that's a good question. Um, I believe they are pure water ice, although I am not an expert in the rings of Saturn. So my my sense is that it kind of gets broken up into its constituent parts as it comes out of the plume. And so you have like water vapor here and a salt molecule here. And so they kind of freeze out separately. Um, I don't know. That's a really interesting question, though. I don't actually know the answer to that. I think it's mostly pure water ice, though. Yeah, well, and and it is. It seems to be that the rings rings are um, basically residues of of an impact of, of perhaps a small satellite, and so whatever the composition of the satellite at the distance of Saturn, obviously, it would have been mostly ice. Although there might have been, there, there does appear to be some meteorite, I, uh, ice and dust. Yeah. yeah. But but as far as salt, no no reason to think it was a salt water moon. Right. So um, the E-ring, Saturn's E-ring is actually uh, made primarily from Enceladus's plume. So that would be one interesting thing to look at. And I don't know yeah. the that one, though. Yeah. Well, wow, what a fascinating discussion. We, we yeah, started. fantastic. Jennifer, and I think, I think it uh, will be interesting to see what you found out by the time you get it to be as old as possible. Yeah. Well, thanks for having me. All right. Well, I think our pleasure. Our pleasure. And that's isn't it? We're, we're pretty much done, I think. Does I think so. Danielle, okay. how's okay. the time? How does Mars look tonight? I think she's out. Yeah, Mars is messy. Klaus, don't you think we'll pass on looking through it? through the clerk tonight? I think so. Yeah, there's not much point really. No. I'll just, I'll just float a lemon in the bathtub and stir it around a bit. <laughs> You're not <laughs> well, Bill. I've, I've known this for a long time. <laughs> That's why I like you so much. <laughs> well, this was fun. This was fun. Jennifer did a great job.